to tell you today about how uh, evolution can inspire creative algorithms. And so in artificial intelligence and machine learning, where I come from and I work uh, trying to achieve artificial intelligence, but obviously also I'm interested in artificial life, um, the big thing that you hear about today is optimization. We have algorithms that can optimize really impressive, inside of really impressive large spaces and large problems. Um, but creativity is something different from optimization, and creativity isn't something we hear as much about like when we talk about things like deep learning. Creativity is something that changes our perception. It doesn't just solve problems, but it changes the way that we think about the world. So it offers things like new designs for buildings, architectures, anything that you can think of, clothing, vehicles, robots, new forms of art and music, uh, new experiences, new kinds of games that we can play. Um, and you can imagine generating vast collections of solutions to problems that we haven't even encountered yet if we could somehow harness creativity in computation. And so that raises the question then, how can we design creative algorithms? Um, what is going to inspire us and inform us so that we can build these kinds of algorithms? And for me, I think that evolution, natural evolution, we see there the tree of life behind me, is, uh, is a really great inspiration for thinking about creativity. A lot of the time we think about creativity in terms of human creativity, but just think about how creative evolution is. I mean, evolution is the source of all of living nature. Every single living thing that has ever existed is the product of this single process. And that is beyond anything that human engineering has achieved, or human creativity has achieved for that matter. I mean, think about the things that have been produced by this process. Things like flight, photosynthesis, human intelligence, a lot of the time, these things are actually built in some kind of engineering sense better than anything that we know how to build right now, and all in the same, so to speak, run of the system. There's only been one run of this particular algorithm. And so we're talking about, for more than a billion years, creating new things nonstop and without bound. And this is not optimization. What we're looking at here is called open-endedness. And that means a process that can continue indefinitely producing interesting and increasingly complex forms. And this is something that we would like to be able to do in computation. Can you imagine if we had the ability to do that? Now, there is a field called evolutionary computation, and I work in that field. Um, and this idea goes back to the 1950s, with a lot of the pioneering work in the 1960s. Um, and it, it, the evolutionary computation is built around what are called evolutionary algorithms, and these are, these are inspired from evolution in nature. So let me just tell you for a second like the basic building blocks of what an evolutionary algorithm is. Basically, inside the computer, you can imagine like what it will do is it will generate some random things, and then it will try to, and then what we'll do is we'll test them. So imagine we generate some robots like inside of a simulator. Then we could test them in, in some environment. And then the better ones we might select and call them parents. And then we can mate and mutate them. In other words, have them have offspring or have babies inside the computer uh, to create a new generation. And then we can repeat this loop. So really all I'm describing though, if that sounds like it's complicated to follow, it's just breeding. You know, this is like what you would do if you're trying to breed better horses or better dogs or something like that. Um, and so uh, this is the basic of an evolutionary algorithm. It sounds like breeding and it sounds like evolution. Um, and by the way, you can also evolve what are called neural networks and that's what people talk about in deep learning. And that's called neuroevolution. Um, so you could actually try to breed smarter and smarter brains in some sense, or a little kind of artificial brain. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting things we can do with these algorithms. So then, I mean, having said that, and having said that evolution is an inspiration for creativity, does that mean that creativity is solved? And this is where it gets interesting, because the answer is that no. Uh, these evolutionary algorithms do not act like nature. And this shows that there's a puzzle that we still haven't really solved which is what is the missing ingredient that we are missing, even though we may be inspired by evolution in nature, that would allow us to actually achieve the kind of open-ended creativity we see in nature. You see, current evolutionary algorithms, what they tend to do is converge. They might converge to a solution. We often will celebrate if that happens. So we say, okay, I need this robot to walk. Then I try to evolve a controller to get the robot to walk, and it walks. They say, oh, this is great. The algorithm worked. If it doesn't work, it might get stuck, and that's even worse. But in either case, it just ends. That's the end. There's nothing else going to happen after that. There's no more creativity. It just came up with this one solution, and that's the end. And by the way, that's the same thing that happens in deep learning. I mean, deep learning, you have some problem, and then you optimize towards it, and then we have a solution, and then we're done. 
That is not what open-endedness is about, or creativity. Open-endedness is about continual creation and creating things we haven't imagined or haven't even asked for. So like all these experiments, and these are mostly experiments that I was involved in, like controlling uh, vehicles and, and robots and playing games and, uh, and, and, and competitions and all kinds of different things, they all just end. It's interesting to look at these algorithms run and see them converge to solutions, but they just end. And so people have tried to be more imaginative, to think of sort of extensions of like the basic evolutionary algorithm to sort of tease out well, what is the missing ingredient here that would make this more open-ended. And so there are what are called co-evolutionary algorithms. These are algorithms where the entities that are being evolved interact with each other while they're evolving. So it's a little more like nature in that sense, like we interact with each other, we interact with other organisms. Um, and you can imagine, for example, you could have a competition. A competition among evolving entities could lead to like an arms race. Um, and that sounds interesting, so maybe they keep getting more and more um, complicated because of that arms race, but these algorithms have shown to still eventually get stuck. Uh, we also see uh, some ideas in other areas outside of evolution that, that have some of the spark of open-endedness, like for example, generative adversarial networks, which are in deep learning, which are used to, um, to learn, uh, to interpolate among a whole set of points that they've been exposed to and cre create new data points are interesting in the fact that they're generative, but they're ultimately just interpolating, so they're not gonna create something genuinely new. So, what explains open-endedness? And what I can tell you is that we are beginning to understand in the last few years some of the ingredients. We don't have all the ingredients because I would submit to you if we had all the ingredients, then, then you know, this would probably be front page news right now because it would be amazing. We'd have the power of creation. But we are beginning to understand some of the ingredients. And one of the most important ingredients is what's called divergence. And that means that things in the search are moving away from each other. Let me show you an example. This is one of the few divergent systems that actually exists. So I think this is a very interesting experiment. This is something we did in my research group um, at the University of Central Florida a few years ago called Pick Breeder. Um, and it, it's a little bit of cheating because there are humans involved, and it's fine for humans to be involved, but, but ultimately we'd like to be able to just build algorithms completely independent and autonomous that are creative on their own. But this is still very interesting because it actually does elicit a divergent process, and we'll see that. And so let me just tell you uh, what's going on in the system. Um, on the left panel, what you see there uh, is a, a bunch of images. Um, there's actually 15 images, they're just blobs. And what you can do in the system is you can choose a blob that you like. So let me show it like this. So here's these 15 images, and the user will choose one. I'll put a star on top of it, okay? So the user says, I like that one, okay? So what happens then is that we can make that the parent of a bunch of children. So it had children, 15 children, and then we can choose another blob that we like. So, okay, there's another blob, and it can have some of its own children. So basically, you're doing breeding now. Humans are interactively breeding. Now, there's an interesting part of this system, which is that we put it on the internet, and we allowed people, if they discovered something, to save it onto a website, and then other people could actually evolve further from there, breed further from there. And so it means people are branching off each other's discoveries inside of Pick Breeder. And so what's really interesting about the system is if you look at the system as a whole and try to imagine like what would happen if we just unleash hundreds of people, which is basically what happened, who are online into a world like this, and they're all sort of branching off each other's discoveries, and what we found is this stuff. So this stuff I think is pretty amazing. Um, these, these all really come from these kind of humble beginnings like this. Um, and these are the things that our users discovered. These are just a small set of examples. Um, but they illustrate the point that not only did people discover what I think are really remarkable images, because these are not actually artists' uh, renditions, these are actually evolutionary discoveries. No one drew these pictures. Um, but they discovered a huge diversity of them. This is an example of a divergent system. So in other words, this system, the longer you run it, the more interesting stuff comes out of it, and it doesn't stop. It's not like it all converged to the butterfly that you see there, or the skull that you see there, and say, we could say, wow, it would be really interesting if we could evolve a skull. That'd be the whole point of the process. But that is not what this is doing. This is evolving everything at once. And this is actually showing some of the hallmarks of open-endedness. So we can learn a lot from a system like this. In fact, you can see why. This is sort of a partial explanation of why it's doing this. This is an actual picture of divergence. And this is what we're looking at here is like at the top of that, of that tree, this is like a family tree, is, the, uh, is an original um, product that somebody evolved in Pick Breeder. And then when you see lines, it means someone else evolved something from that. 
So along those lines, there might be many steps where somebody was evolving or breeding something. And so what you see here is, this is not the whole pick breeder, this is a small uh, part of pick breeder, but what you see here is several dozen human beings interacting with each other by branching off of each other's creations. And you can see that what you're actually looking at is divergence. You're seeing that every time someone discovers something, it creates potential to discover something else. So in effect, what these people are doing is they're creating, they're collecting stepping stones together, unwittingly in some sense, since they're not actually actively talking to each other. But whenever someone discovers something, that creates an opportunity for someone else to discover something else and so on. And so we get divergence. And so this, for me, uh, seeing Pick Breeder and seeing how people use the system and how it worked uh, was really eye-opening. And I mean, I noticed some things, like for example, I noticed, and, and my colleagues and I, as we were working on it, noticed that in some cases, in almost every case, actually, that, that somebody discovered something interesting, like, say, a picture of a butterfly, they were not trying to discover it. This is one of the interesting properties of divergent systems, is that often the best way to discover something is by not trying to discover it. Um, and this is because the, we don't necessarily know which stepping stones will lead to the discoveries that we're interested in. And we're interested in a lot of discovery when we're interested in creativity. So, my colleagues and I, in particular, Joe Lehman, who, who was at the time a, a PhD student in my group, uh, tried to actually formalize some of this notion into an algorithm that could run on its own. And that came to be known as novelty search, which is now uh, pretty well known within artificial life. And the novelty search algorithm is kind of a radical idea because it basically it doesn't try to optimize anything. It is, a, it is a learning algorithm in a sense, but all it does is try to discover things that are different from what it's seen before. And so it's purely divergent and it doesn't have any specific objective. And so it is inspired by pick breeder though. The idea is that maybe we can get a pick breeder like process to happen inside of a computer um, automatically. And so some people think when they hear something like that, that oh, this might be like random, right? Like, I mean, this, this algorithm is sort of just, uh, it's, it's just doing things without any particular end goal in mind, but it's actually not random. It's no more random than evolution on Earth is random, or pick breeder is random. Because if you think about it, the concept of novelty is not random. Novelty is an information-rich concept, which means that I'm comparing where I'm going to where I've been in the past, and that takes a lot of information. And so you don't get random results. In fact, you, get, you do get a pick breeder-like process. In fact, it was really some quite surprising results came out of this, where we saw, for example, that sometimes the discoveries that came out of not trying to optimize the system were better than if you try to optimize it. Like this is just one example like this, where we said, okay, take this robot, this is a biped robot, and just do novel stuff. Not try to walk, just do things that are different and you'll be rewarded for that. Versus um, on the left, you'll see a video of, let's optimize walking and get it to walk as far as possible. And what was interesting is if you watch is that actually when we search for novelty, instead of for the optimal walk, we get a better walk. And this is a kind of a paradox, is that sometimes we do better by not actually trying to achieve the goal that we ultimately achieve. And this is because the stepping stones that lead to, uh, yeah, and that, that guy obviously couldn't last very long, the optimized one. But that's because the stepping stones that lead to walking may not look like walking. For example, oscillation is like a stepping stone that leads to walking. Well, well if you discover uh, uh, oscillation, you don't necessarily move forward. You might fall on your face. Novelty search will like that because it's something new. Whereas optimization will see it as not moving along the gradient of improvement. And so it actually can be very powerful to create a divergent process and you can discover some really interesting things. Um, and this later led then to what now we're calling quality diversity algorithms. This is a new class of algorithms where they search for, in effect, something like novelties, divergent, but at the same time, within each niche that they find, they try to be as high quality as possible. So it combines the idea of diversity with the idea of some kind of objective notion of quality. And this led to a whole new slew of algorithms that do this. And what's interesting about these algorithms, they're starting to look more like nature in a sense. Because what they return to you is not just like a single uh, result, which is like you solve the problem, but they return what we're sort of starting to call a repertoire, lots of different things that are interesting. So for example, like in a single run, you can get all these different creatures, like these are different creatures evolved by one of these quality diversity algorithms. 
like those are just a sampling, so you might get dozens and dozens of different walking creatures. Or this is an interesting example here. Here on the cover of Nature is a quality diversity algorithm called Map Elites, which discovered a whole repertoire of gates for this particular robot. And why that's useful is because if the robot breaks, it can go into its repertoire and find a gate that's suitable to its new form, to its new physical form. And so you can see there's actually practical implications to doing this kind of research. But, and I want to sort of uh, close with the notion that uh, even these kinds of algorithms won't invent forever. forever. I want to leave you with the, the idea, just because it's exciting, I think, to think that there's future possibilities, that these QD algorithms are not the end of the story. We haven't solved open-endedness. Uh, even these will eventually stop. And that's because what happens when the space of the possible is filled? So like, what happens after you find all of the possible gates for the robot? Once you've found all those gates, there's nothing else to do. Where do new possibilities come from? And forever. Nature seems to be going forever. I mean, a billion years is about as close as we'll get to forever. And it keeps finding new things to do. Where are these new things coming from? Like, we need a new robot at some point in order to find new gates, because we've exhausted the current robot. And the answer to that is that the system needs to generate new opportunities and search through them at the same time. And that's the key to Earth's open-ended creativity, is that evolution is not just generating solutions to problems, but it's also generating the problems. In other words, when trees evolved, it created an opportunity for there to be giraffes. And so it is, a tree is both a solution to a kind of problem and an opportunity. And every one of us in the room today is an opportunity for each other to do things we wouldn't be able to do if we weren't here together. And so that is what is creating the open-ended dynamic and allowing us to do that. And this is the inspiration for really cutting-edge new algorithms that I think will be ultimately able to achieve true open-ended creativity. So I just wanted to end by showing you a few examples um, just to, to kind of whet your appetite. Like I said, we haven't achieved open-endedness, but I want to show you just some, some steps towards open-ended systems that do exist that are kind of interesting that might inspire you. So for example, here's a video game where the weapons, you're seeing weapons there for, in a space game, uh, were created by, an, by a quality, basically effectively a quality diversity divergent algorithm um, while the game is played. So it's inventing new weapons. These are not invented by game designers. These are invented by the algorithm itself. So content generation. Physical designs are being evolved all the time. Imagine if we could hook this into an open-ended system. We could evolve amazing physical designs. Music and sound are being evolved now. Imagine these in divergent, open-ended scenarios. Even this is kind of interesting to think about. This is a game where people were allowed to, breed, to interact with the system to breed new kinds of flowers. And what was fun about it is, as you see in the bottom panel there, you could actually take a flower that you evolved, hit a button, and order it to be delivered to your house. So you could give it to your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Um, and so you can imagine this kind of a thing where open-ended systems with humans in the loop, the realization of them could be actually physical um, and something that you could touch. And so if you're interested in these things, um, we wrote a whole book about it, which would take more than 15 minutes to talk about. Um, but you could learn about it further here. There's a lot of thoughts. Uh, it's called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Uh, I wrote this with my colleague, Joel Lehman. And I just lastly want to say uh, that the implications are huge if we can conquer this problem. Um, all the new things that we can design, the repertoires we can create, the generation of new kinds of entertainment, new kinds of worlds. Imagine the video games where you're actually, they actually are like Earth, where you're truly discovering new things every time you come in. Um, a new understanding of our own process of human invention, which is also an open-ended process, could accelerate the process of invention. And human-coupled systems, where humans are in the loop, like in PicBreeder, of open-ended systems, helping to guide them, not towards a particular goal, but towards everywhere that we can possibly imagine. Thank you. <laughs>